Great time. Excited about uh, Celebration Sunday. So uh, God's done a lot over the last six years. God has done a lot uh, over the last year. And just thinking about uh, just our grand opening last year uh, here in Numeli and just all of the all the things God done and, uh, and all of the new people that we've met. And uh, if you are, have been a part of this church here within just the last year, you just started coming to Red Tree within the last year since our grand opening, uh, we're, so, we're so grateful for you. We're so profoundly grateful for you and um, look forward to what God has uh, in store for uh, us all ahead. Thank you to the worship team. Wasn't that a good worship, good looking worship team this morning? So uh, thank you for, uh, thank you for that. Excited to see Cameron. Uh, Cameron is in the Navy, uh, stationed out in the Seattle area and he's home and he's hanging out with us. So let's hear it for Cameron. And um, thank you for serving. Thank you. So love you. So excited to see Luke uh, back home from a mission trip from Cuba. Uh, and so, uh, so excited. Next week, we're going to get to hear from Morgan and Patrick and Luke about their uh, trips to Cuba and their trips to, uh, to Southeast Asia and what God uh, did there. So excited to hear from them last week and uh, or, or next week. And then also Brett Wilhelm was here last week uh, sharing about his mission trip to Hungary uh, coming up and just here in the next few days. And if you'd like to be a part of that and to help him and to sponsor him, uh, you can just write a, a, a check or you can give online, drop it in the offering box, just mark mission trip to Hungary. And uh, I know that'll be a blessing as Brett goes to share uh, the love of Jesus around the world. Uh, Caden, I think we got a picture of a guy back there. We got a picture of a guy back there? Nope. Is there a picture of a guy? He looks kind of like Ben, if Ben kind of let himself go for a little bit. There you go. Does that look like you? Like if Ben, like, he kind of lets himself go a little bit. Anybody else see it? Yeah. So, no. Uh, anybody know who's, who this is? But my first thought, if you guys ever seen Jumanji, like when Robin Williams' Jumanji comes back, it kind of reminded me of that. This is... Jose Salvador Alvarenga. On November 8th, 2012, 39-year-old Jose Salvador Alvarenga set out from the coast, Costa Azul in Mexico for a 30-hour deep-sea fishing excursion. It's how he, he, he's a fisherman. That's what he did. And, and his normal partner wasn't able to go with him, and so there was a 23-year-old, far more inexperienced uh, fisherman that went with him by the name of Ezekiel Cordoba. So they headed out into the ocean with a 23-foot-long fishing boat. So imagine your, your, your pickup truck. It's twice as long, about the width. So they head out to the ocean for 30 hours uh, to, to fish. And while they're out there, they're blown off course by this storm that, that come and it lasts for five days. And the storm is so severe, they, they lose the, the use of their motor, much of their electronic equipment, and much of their fishing equipment. They've got enough juice in their battery for the radio to, to make a call for help, but then it dies to where it's not of use so that people can find them. So here they are. Two guys in a fishing boat about the twice the size of a pickup truck. And they have drifted out to sea. They have no sail. They have no oars. They have no motor. motor. Uh, they have no radio. They have no running lights. Uh, they have no anchor. And so a search party is sent out for them. And they look for a couple days. But due to the storm and, and the fog and the rain, uh, they're not able to find them. Now, thankfully, Jose was an experienced fisherman, and he knew how to catch fish by hand, and turtles, and birds, and jellyfish. And that's how they, they ate. They caught, he caught these items by, by, by hand. For, for drinking water, they used rainwater and turtle blood. Anybody want to sign up for that? And their own urine. So unfortunately, Ezekiel Coroba uh, died after about four weeks, but Jose Alvarengo survived. His boat finally washing up to the shore of the Marshall Islands, somewhere between the Philippines and Hawaii. 
6,700 miles away from where they left. And in total, he had drifted 438 days. Can you just imagine that? Imagine, imagine being just drifting along in the ocean for, for 438 days and finally you arrive land and it turns out you, you have drifted 6,700 miles away from where you put in. We've been in this series the last several weeks called Drift and we've talked about how easy it is to drift that a lot of times we don't even notice when we're drifting. And sometimes it's, it's we're in the ocean, we're swimming, we're hanging out with friends, we're hanging out with family, and we look back and we say, wow, I, 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 am, I am so far from where I put in. Uh, the undercurrent has caused me to, to, to drift from where I, I wanted to be and where I was originally. Or, or if you've been out on a lake without, without, a, uh, without an anchor, or the anchor isn't set right, and you may look at the, the lake and you say, wow, it's really calm. It's really still. I'm not going to drift. But, but without an anchor, it won't take very long at all until we drift far away. And we talked about it. it's, it's so easy to drift. It takes no effort whatsoever. Most of the time, we don't even notice that we've drifted away. And it's true in our friendships and our relationships that we can drift away from people. It's true in our marriages that if we're not intentional, we're not careful, we can drift away from one another. And it's so true in our relationship with God that if we're not pursuing intimacy, if we're not pursuing knowing and loving and following Jesus, if we're not careful, it's really, really easy for us to drift away from God. We can drift through life. Our, our, our mental health can, can, can drift. We don't even notice, but we start going to places uh, that are just unhealthy for us. We can drift for all kinds of reasons. Some is just part of, of life here on earth. That, that just like if you go on a float trip, there is a current taking you in a certain direction. Life here in our culture on earth is taking us, the current is taking us in a certain direction. And it's often not the direction towards intimacy with God. We can, we can drift, we can get off course just by a storm. Can you imagine going out, you're expecting to go fishing for 30 hours and instead being gone for 14 months? A storm can hit, and a storm can take us so far off course like it did these two guys. Or how about this? Just we're going through life. Our things, are, things are going well. God's going well. Things are going well. And then a storm hits. We lose our job, or, or, or we lose someone that, that's important to us, or something that's important to us. We lose a loved one. Maybe something happens and we're mistreated, or we're overlooked, or some type of abuse that we endure. Life on earth is not fair. And life here on, on earth, people aren't always kind. People aren't always thoughtful. Sometimes people can be cruel and hurtful. People don't always make the best decisions and that can impact us and that can cause us to, to, to drift from where we want to be and where God wants us to be. And not only do others not always make the best decisions, sometimes we don't always make the best decisions. And we can drift from where we want to be. Sometimes we know what's best. We know what God wants us to do. And for whatever reasons, we choose to do the exact opposite and do go the exact wrong way and find ourselves in a place far from where we should be. As we look through scripture, we can see a lot of people that have drifted. I think of just a few. I think of Peter. Peter is one of Jesus' closest friends, one of his, his best friends. And he got to the point where there was so much pressure around him and he got so full of fear that in one night, even though he said he would never do it, in one night, he, he denied even knowing who Jesus was three times. And that night, Peter drifted from, from where he wanted to be and where he knew that he should be because of just, just the pressure all around him and the pressure of that situation, and he just crumbled. And I wonder, how many times do we do the same thing? 
that we're around a certain group of people or we find ourselves in a certain situation and we feel the pressure or, or we're worried about what else is around us is going to think. And so we give in and we drift away. Or, or how about a, another guy that was lost at sea? Ever heard of a guy named Jonah? Jonah drifted. God said, hey, I want you to go to Nineveh and, and I want you to share this message. And Jonah's like, I don't want to go to Nineveh, and so I'm going to get a boat, and I'm going to go the exact opposite direction. Jonah drifted because of the choice that he made, made that he, he ran away from God and from where God had told him to go. And it reminds me of us. Because how many times in our lives do we know better? And we know what God wants us to do. And we don't want to do it. So, so we just head off in the opposite direction. Or, or how about this? Sometimes we drift because something or someone has happened or something someone has said or done has wounded us greatly, has hurt us deeply. And it caused us to end up in a place that we never thought we would end up. It's the last place we want to be, but because of what someone said or because of what someone did, something that happened to us at no fault of our own, we can find ourselves drifting away from where we want to be. That maybe you trusted someone that wasn't trustworthy, and they said or did something that was, that, that was hurtful and, and hurt us greatly. The, the first time in the Bible that, that God is referred to by someone by name is by a lady named Hagar. And who Hagar was is that she was a servant. And there's a different culture, different time. She was a slave. She, she was a slave to this woman named Sarah. And she was there to, to, to serve Sarah. And God came to Sarah's husband, Abraham, at one point. says, Abraham, I have great plans for you. This is what I want you to do. I want you to leave your home. I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave the security. And I want you to go to a place I'm going to show you. Go out in faith. And, and Abraham, if you follow me, if you obey me, if you pursue me in faith, I, I'm going to make you famous. I, I, I promise you that this land that everywhere you step on is going to belong to you and your descendants. I'm going to give you so many descendants you can't even count them. It'd be like going to the beach and trying to count the grains of sands. I, I'm going to make you famous. I'm going to make you, I'm going to bless everyone who ever lives through you, Abraham. And so then they're in this situation and Abraham's like, all right, that's God. That's great. God, I'm going to go. But you're telling me I'm going to have these descendants. Well, I'm an old man and I don't have any kids at all. And so Sarah decides to, to, to uh, take matters into her own hands. How many times do we get in trouble? How many times do we drift because we take things out of God's hands and we put them in our hands? We say, okay, God, this, this, is, this, is, what, this is what I'm going to do and, I'm gonna, and we can get ahead of God. So Sarah says, I'm not able to give you children so Abraham, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take my servant, Hagar. I want you to sleep with her so that she can have children on, on, on my behalf. So that this promise that God made to you can, 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 can come through. So Abraham uh, sleeps with Hagar. She gets pregnant. And so now Hagar's looking at Sarah, and, and there's some conflict there. And, and Sarah's looking at Hagar, and there's some conflict there. And so Sarah begins to mistreat her. And mistreats Hagar um, so badly that, that Hagar just runs away. And as she runs away, God always runs faster. And he finds Hagar and he, he promises her, he tells her to go back home. I'm going to take care of you. That I'm going to give you so many descendants, Hagar, you can't even count them. They're innumerable. And I'm going to start off with giving you a son by the name of Ishmael. And even there, God tells Hagar, Ishmael is going to have conflict with, and he's going to have conflicts with Sarah's son, Isaac, that they're always going to be in conflict. And it's, it, we see this conflict even today, this hostility in the Middle East. So in Genesis chapter 16, 
verse 13, that God has showed up to Hagar and has told her to go back home, tell her, I'm going to take care of you, I'm going to bless you. And this is what Hagar responds to what the Lord had said. Genesis 16, 13. She, Hagar, gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. So here's Hagar in the middle of the desert, in the middle of the wilderness. She has run away. She doesn't know what's going to happen. She don't know what she's going to do. So God shows up and her response to what God told her is that you're the God that sees me in my pain. You're the God that sees me in my loneliness. You're the God that knows my heart, that knows what I'm going through, that God, you haven't forgotten me, but you're still right with me. And God, you're the God, El Roy is is the, the Hebrew term, that you're the God who sees me. In scripture, we see so many people who end up far away from where they planned and wanted to be. They've drifted, sometimes without noticing it, Sometimes because that's just what they decided to do. God, I know this is what you want me to do, but I'm going to do the opposite. And I love how seeing how in each situation, how God responds to people that drift. And really, as we think about Jesus' life and Jesus' teachings, you know what Jesus' life was all about? It was pursuing people that drifted. It was his response to people that had turned their back on him. It was his response to purple people that had drifted away from him. And as you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as you read through the, the, the life and the teachings of the story of Jesus, we see over and over again that Jesus meets people where they're at. Regardless of, of what they've been through, regardless of what they've done, Jesus meets them where they're at People that are hurting, people that have drifted, people that have just run away. And Jesus, in each situation, helps them find healing and hope and gives them a second chance and helps them come back home. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus is is teaching about drifting. And he tells three stories. And they give us such a clue into God's heart for people that have drifted for us we've drifted every single one of us have drifted whether we knew what God wanted us to do and we did the opposite whether we just got got swept up and just 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 life here on earth whether we just weren't paying attention or became negligent in our relationship with God, that that every single one of us have drifted away from God. And the great news about the gospel is that Jesus came for people that drifted just like you and just like me. So in Luke chapter 15, verse 3, Jesus tells uh, these three stories. The first one is this. Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and his neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. He's talking to the Pharisees, the religious leaders that saw themselves as better as everyone else. And they ridiculed Jesus because Jesus hung out with people that had drifted. They, they had hung, were hang out with people that were sinners that, that the Pharisees looked down on. So Jesus tells a story about a shepherd. The shepherd's job is to take care of his sheep, to protect them from wolves, protect them from other things that might attack, protect them from them, themselves from wandering off. To, to lead them to food, to lead them to water, to, to lead them to uh, security and safety, to provide for them. And in this parable, Jesus is referring to himself as the shepherd. He says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to imagine a shepherd has a hundred sheep 
and one of the sheep strays away. One of the sheep drifts away. Jesus says, what do you think that shepherd's going to do if he's a good shepherd? He, he for a little while, he, he's going to leave the 99 and he's going to pursue and he's going to search and he's going to hunt for the, the one that got lost, the one that strayed away, the one that drifted, you and me, that the drift. And when he finds that sheep, you know what the shepherd's going to do? He's going to rejoice. He's going to scoop it up and he's going to put it on his shoulders and he's going to bring that sheep back to where he belongs. And when he does, you know what he's going to do? He's going to throw a party. And Jesus tells the, 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 the Pharisees this, that every time someone who has drifted away comes back to God, you know what Jesus does? You know what happens in heaven? There's a party. There's rejoicing. And, and he, he, he breaks this mindset that I think is so popular today, just like it was then, is that when we drift away from God, what we think is, oh, I can't go back to God. He's mad at me. Oh, I can't go, go back to God. I, I, I've blown it too bad. And if he's going to put his finger in my face and he's going to give me a big lecture. And I love in these stories, in these parables, that, that Jesus very clearly instructs him, when we drift, he searches for us. And if we're willing to come back home, he picks us up and he carries us back and he throws a party and heaven rejoices. Heaven celebrates. I, 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 love, the, I love the fact that he picked a sheep. And, and, and I, love this, I love this picture of, of just wandering around. I remember this is our sixth birthday as, as a church. I remember, I, I remember very clearly, very early on in the life of our church, I would say all the time, we didn't start Red Tree just so church people would have a different option to choose from on a Sunday morning. That was not the heart or, or, or at all the mission of why we started this church. It wasn't just so like we got a bunch of different restaurants to choose to go to lunch. Oh, here's a bunch of churches you can choose. You can find the one you like. Our heartbeat of starting this church was not at all so that church people would have a different option to choose for on a Sunday morning. Our heart for starting this church, it, it, it was this. It's to help people that drifted. It's to help people like the sheep that just is kind of wandering through life and just trying to, trying to figure it all out. For people that don't have it all together. For people that are hurting and struggling and what they need most is they need to know Jesus and to know his grace and his forgiveness and his hope that he brings and his healing that he brings. We started this church, it was not so that church people would have a different option to choose for on a Sunday morning. It was to help the hurting, to help those that are trying to figure it all out, to help those that, that don't have it all together. That's the, that's the heartbeat. And I love this, this, this picture of a sheep that just wanders away. And then he picks it up here in verse 8 where he tells another story. Suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and she loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way I tell you, Jesus says, in the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. And I love this, this picture again, this word picture. Imagine this woman has 10 coins that are valuable and, and she loses one. What does she do? She says, oh, I got nine. I'm okay. I don't, I don't really need the other one. I got nine others. No, it's, it's the same point. She turns on every light. She lights a lamp. She searches diligently uh, for every corner of the house until she finally finds it. And when she finds it, she rejoices. She calls her friends and says, celebrate with me, rejoice with me, because my coin that was valuable to me is, is found again. And I love here the picture of a coin. I love the picture of the sheep, the sheep that wanders away, and a shepherd that picks it up and brings it back. And I love here the picture of a coin, because when we drift away, we need to know that we matter to God. 
that, that we're valuable to him. That we're important to him enough that he's going to, to, to light a lamp, search the house, and throw a party when we come back to where we belong. And again, there's a party not just here, but a party in heaven. Then the last one, last story Jesus tells is this. Luke 15, verse 11. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. And not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Finally, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out. I'll go back to my father and I'll say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired servants. So here's a, a, a dad that's got two sons. And the younger one just, just, just needs to get out. He needs to, 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 to live a little. He needs to experience uh, some life a little. So he comes to his father and he essentially says, Dad, I know you're not dead yet, but I want my inheritance now. So essentially what he's saying to his father is, is Dad, I kind of wish you were dead already so I could have my money so I could go out and, and, and I could just live my life. So the father says, okay, son, well, here's your portion. Here's your, here's your portion of my estate. Here's your inheritance. And so the son leaves home. He squanders all of his wealth in wild living, does anything that he feels like doing, and until everything is gone and everyone else is gone. And he's so hungry, he's longing to eat pig slop. And he says, you know what? He comes to his sentence and he decides to return. The, the Bible word is to, to repent. That means to turn back to God. Verse 20. So the son got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, the father saw him, was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and sinned against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. And so they began to celebrate. So I love this picture. The, the, the story that Jesus is telling that here's the son that has, has pretty much told his dad, Dad, I wish you were dead so I could have your attendance and I could go live my life and live it up. And that's what he does. He, he leaves home, he, he parties, he does whatever he feels like doing. And then until all the money runs out, and he's at, he's at rock bottom. And he's thinking, what am I going to do? Maybe I can just go back home and ask my dad, Dad, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I'm not. I've blown it. I don't deserve it at all. But I'm hungry. And I'm, I'm in a bad spot. Would you just hire me as one of your servants? Can I just work for you, Dad? I know I've blown it. I know I've wasted it. Would you just hire me? And I can only imagine him walking back home to his father. And how many times in that journey did he rehearse what he was going to say over and over and over again? All right, I'm going to see my dad and I'm, going to, I'm not even going to look at him. I'm going to bow down and I'm going to tell him I'm not worthy, that I've blown it, that, 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 I, that I, I, I was wrong and I've blown it. And I'm not worthy to be a son anymore, but, but maybe could you please, please, please Hire me because I'm hungry and I'm hurting and I'm struggling. And I'm imagining this, him just rehearsing this speech that he's going to give his dad when he sees him. And as he's headed home, I, I love it that Jesus says, the father saw him at a distance. And when he saw him at a distance, he, he ran to him. And he was 
filled with compassion for his son. And when he runs to him and he sees him, he, he, he throws his arms around him and he begins kissing him. And, and, and the son starts to give him the speech, I'm not worthy to be your son, would you hire me? And, and the father just ignores the speech. And he looks to the, the people that work for him and says, hey, 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 this one, I want you to get the best robe. I, I want you to get to the ring that belongs to my son and, and, and put it on his finger. And I want you to get the best fatted calf, the one that we've been saving uh, for, for a celebration. We're having steak tonight. We're partying tonight. And I love this picture of how Jesus responds, how the Father responds to us when we drift. For the last several weeks, we've talked about what it means to drift, how easy it is to drift, the reasons that we drift, what we should do to, to keep from drifting. We've talked about what, what do we do when we drifted and, and we want to come back home. But this morning, instead of us looking at our side of the drift equation, this morning I want to celebrate and look at God's side of the drift equation. How does God react? How does God feel? How does God respond when we drift? And it's clear from the beginning in Genesis all the way through the end of Scripture that how does God respond to when we drift, well, let's ask Hagar. Hagar, when you've been hurt, when you've been mistreated, when you've been abused and you ran away and you were all alone and you didn't know what you're going to do, how did God respond to you when you drifted? Hagar would tell us. He saw me. He didn't leave me. He didn't abandon me. I thought I was alone, but I wasn't alone. He, he was with me. He hadn't given up on me. He still had plans for me. He saw me. Or let's ask Peter. Peter, when you drifted, how did God react? How did God respond? How did God feel? Well, I, I, I drifted the night that he got arrested and he, he was crucified and he died the next day. And I thought it was over and I didn't know what I was going to do because I did things I never dreamt I would ever do. And I said I would never do. And I drifted so far away and I didn't know what I was going to do. And then three days later on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb and they came back and they said the tomb was empty and they saw Jesus. And one, one of the things Jesus says is go tell the disciples and Peter that I'm going to go meet him ahead of, uh, I'm going ahead and I'm going to meet them. Peter said, Jesus called me by name. I denied him three times in one night, and he called me by name. Tell Peter I'm going to meet up with him tonight. And then later, Peter's out fishing, and Jesus is going to restore and forgive him. And, and, and so what does Jesus do to Peter? He made him breakfast, and he sat down with him, and he gave him grace and mercy and Forgiveness, or let's ask, let's ask Jonah. Hey, Jonah, God said go this way, and you went this way. You want to talk about drifting? You want to talk about being lost at sea? Jonah was lost at sea. He, he, he was, he didn't find himself in a fishing boat uh, 6,700 miles away from where he started. He found himself in the belly of a giant fish. He, he was lost to see. What would Jonah tell us about what happened when he drifted? What God would respond? God gave me a second chance. God pursued me in a boat, in the middle of the ocean, in a, in, a, in, a, in a fish, and on the shore. He didn't give up on me. He gave me a second chance. I love these three stories that Jesus tells. Because we're just like the sheep. And the people that we rub elbows with every day of our lives, we're just like the sheep. We wander away. And God says, I want to I protect you. I want to provide for you. I'm going to give you what, what you need, food, water. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to lead you. I'm going to guide you. But, but we just wander away. Jesus searches for us and he, he longs to scoop us up and to, to bring us back home. 
And I love the story of the coin, that just like the coin, each and every single one of us are valuable to God. We matter to him. He cares about us. He wasn't like, oh, I got nine other coins. I'm okay. No, he, he diligently searched for the coin. And when he found it, he threw a party because the coin was of great value to him. And when we come back to him, we know that we are of great value to him. We, when we've drifted, we know that we are of great value to him. So much so he's going to search for us. And I love the story of the lost son. Because just like the son, we in our lives have rejected the father. We, we've run away in a direction we shouldn't have gone. We've, we've made some really, really poor choices. We, we've squandered a lot of the good things that God has given us and has, has done for us. And that we come to the point of, should we come back? And I think just like the sun, we worry about it. Just like the sun, we're like, I, I have no excuse. I, I, have, I have no excuse. I chose this. I drifted. I ran away. That, that just like the sun, I, I think when we do that, we're embarrassed about it. I, I can't believe I did it. And, and Satan comes to us and he whispers the same thing to us and the people around us that I think he did to the, the, to the, to the sun as well is, you know what, maybe you should just stay away. Maybe you shouldn't go back. Maybe you should just kind of live in isolation because you did this, you did it yourself, you can't blame anyone else but yourself. And maybe we should just, maybe we should stay in isolation and continue to be unhappy and continue to be miserable and continue to be living an unfulfilled life. And not willing to, to go back to the Father. Or maybe it's time for us to come to our senses. And if we were honest, we would say, you know what? I really have drifted from God. I didn't mean to. I didn't even notice. But I've, I, I, I've drifted. Or, or maybe it's this. I, I did mean to. That, that, that I gave in, that I, I started making some really bad choices that I knew that God didn't want me to do. And, and it's my time now that it's time for me to come back to my senses and come back to a father who's waiting for me. Maybe you feel unworthy. Maybe you're trying to figure it out and you're searching. Maybe you're wondering, how is God going to react to me? And I love it here in scripture that we see how God feels and responds and reacts when we've drifted. It doesn't matter how long we've drifted. It doesn't matter how far we've drifted. It doesn't matter what we've done or what we said. It doesn't matter why we did it. That we see clearly in scripture this. That God sees you. He hasn't given up on you. He hasn't forgotten you. He hasn't abandoned you. He's still right there. That God values you. That, that you're important to him. That, that, that he, he cares about you. That you, that, that you matter. That God doesn't give up on us. He didn't tell Peter, ah, Peter, you blew it. Ah, Jonah, you blew it. No, he, he pursued them and, and he pursues us. He doesn't give up on us. When, when God sees us, when we've drifted, his heart is full of compassion. And if he sees us turning and coming back to him, what does he do? He, he runs to us and he wraps his arms around us and, and he kisses us and he, and he celebrates that God still sees us as his children, not his servants. And today, if you're here today and you said, you know what, if I was really honest, I've, I've drifted. Maybe for, maybe for a month, maybe for a couple of years, maybe for a couple of decades, maybe your entire life, I've drifted. Like I know where God wants you to be and I'm the opposite direction and, and I don't know what I'm going to do. This is what we can know from scripture. This is what Jesus has told us. He's longing. He's longing to bring you back home. 
He's longing to welcome you back. And the moment that we turn to him, he runs to us. And when he sees us, what does he do? He throws a party. So glad you're here today on Celebration Sunday. We have a lot, lot to celebrate. And the greatest thing we have to celebrate is that we have a father who loves us and longs to bring us back to where we belong. Go ahead and close your eyes and bow your heads. I want you to think just for a moment, where where are you in your relationship with God? Would you say that that you used to be close, but you've really kind of drifted away? Maybe it's been a few months or a few years or a few decades. Or or maybe you say, you know what? I've never really been close to God. I've kind of wondered about God, but I've never never really been, been close to him. Well, the greatest news of all time is that when we turn our back on God, he still loves us and welcomes back home. And if you're here today, and you've never given your life to Jesus, I want you to know that you matter to God. He sees you. He cares about you. He has plans for you. He hasn't given up on you. He's a God of second chances. And he sees you as a son or a daughter, not as a servant. And he's longing for you to come to him, and he's going to celebrate and throw a party. If you're here today, and you'd like to give your life to God, you can, you can pray something very simple, just like this, right where you're sitting. You can pray, uh, dear God, I know that I've drifted away from you and where you want me to be. God, I know that not only have I drifted, but there have been times that I've just run in the opposite direction. And God, just like the the, the sun, I'm not worthy of your love. I'm not worthy of your forgiveness. But God, I, I thank you That when we give you our speech of how unworthy we are, you ignore it, you forgive us, you wrap your arms around us, and you throw a party saying, my son, my daughter, they're back home. So God, here today, I want to come back home. I want to come to you. I want to turn away from from my drifting, and I just want to come back to your arms. Please forgive me. Please help me. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Keep your eyes closed and heads bowed just for one one more moment. If today that's you, and you, 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 you've drifted, and, and today you say, I, I don't want to drift anymore. And, and pastor, I, I just want you to know, I, I prayed that prayer. I, 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 I came back to God today. If that's you, slip up your hand. Say, I came back home today. I, I'm, I'm tired of drifting. Awesome, awesome. Father, we thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness. We thank you that you don't give up on us. We thank you that you pursue us. And when we come back home, you embrace us and you throw a party. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God is calling us back to him. Let's stand and worship him again through song.
It's one of my favorite songs. Yes. <laughs> it should be our prayer, right? God, where are you going to take us? As long as we're, we're connected to the vine and we can just pour out to others around us. Guys, I'm so glad you were here with us today. And I, I pray that you walk away refreshed, right? The world's loud out there. There's a lot of hurt and there's a lot of hard. And even in our, in our own lives, there's a lot of hurt and hard. And just to remember that we stay anchored to the Lord and with him, all things are possible, right? I love it. You guys, a couple of announcements before I, I let you go. We've got, um, I want to invite the youth here. We've got our back to school retreat in a couple of weeks. It's after the first week of school. Woohoo! I, we're going to need it. We're going to go back into school. It's going to be like, what? I have to wake up early. I have to sit through classes. I have to learn. It's going to be hard, so we're going to need each other. It's um, August 26th to the 28th. It's going to be at High Hill, so it's really close. We're going to have a lot of fun together and food and fellowship and Bible study and worship, and it's going to be fabulous. So I want to invite you, if you're in middle school or high school, to please uh, sign up online. We would love to have you. And then secondly, we've got something going on for the ladies coming up because it's all almost fall, y'all. How weird is that? I haven't said that yet, but it almost is, right? And so um, I want to in invite all the ladies here to uh, check out our website because we're going on a road trip. We're going to Branson, and it's going to be so much fun. We did it last year, and it was a blast. Uh, September 30th through October 2nd, guys can take care of kids for the weekend. Girls can go out and just have a little bit of camaraderie together and just worship. There's a conference, Women of Joy, but we're also staying on Table Rock Lake at the Marsh's house, and I'm so excited. So it's just going to be a lot of fun, a lot of girl time. So please make plans to attend. It's going to be a blast. You won't regret it. Lastly, we have lunch. And we have fun. We have a dunk tank out there, and we have a water slide that everybody can, like, just get wet on. It'll be super fun. And we have lunch provided by John and Daniel Schmidt. So we've got some pulled pork. We get some hot dogs for the kiddos. Um, we've got some um, other sides, and it's going to be fun. And we have a birthday cake and some cupcakes. And so even if you're, like, not used to eating birthday cake, it's a birthday party today. So please make plans to do that. It's going to be fun. There's some games that sit outside, too. Basketball court. I mean, it doesn't matter if you haven't played basketball in a while, if you want to just show these kids a thing or two, that'll be super fun. If you are joining us today, it's your first day at Red Tree. We're so glad that you worshiped with us today. And there's a card, um, probably in a seat right in front of you. If you would be so kind to say, hey, yeah, I was the first time guest. If you want any information about Jesus or about Red Tree, please mark that. We just want to say thanks for coming. Yeah? Is that good? Are you guys ready? Let's pray, and then I'm going to release you. We're going to um, go, outside, go downstairs, because that's where the food's going to be set up in just a little bit, so you can mingle for a bit. Food's going to be set up downstairs in our kitchen, so I'd love for you to go down these stairs, and we'll make a line. We'll get food, and we'll come out this door, and we'll walk around. We've got lots of tables and chairs set up, and then outside in the culvert, it's going to be drinks, and then soon to be desserts, so it's going to be fun. Let's pray, yeah? Thank you, Heavenly Father, for such a beautiful day that you blessed us with. And thank you for such a beautiful Red Tree family and guests who are here celebrating with us today. Father, we are blessed beyond measure. Your promises endure. I thank you, Father God, for what you've done in Red Tree. It's all you. We're just, we're just your hands and feet and your mouthpiece, Lord God. Thank you for doing exceedingly abundantly above all we could ever ask, think, or imagine. Thank you, Father God, for being with us always, for never leaving us or forsaking us. Thank you for what you've already done. Thank you for what you're doing today, and thank you for what you're going to do in the future. We are yours. Father God, may, may our conversation today, may our play today be a, be a sweet sound to you. May we love each other well, and bless this food to our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes? Let's go play.